Um, this is my first time presenting at the IAAS webinar. So I hope we have more chances to, to have more such engagements in the future. Right, so let me just start to share my slides and then I'll get into the topic proper. Right, so give me a minute while I get my slides to be shared. Okay, you should see my slides open in a minute. And as it's uh, preparing to open, it's still opening on my screen. I just thought that I should give a little bit of a brief introduction about what I am, who I am and who I represent, right? Can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. So let me just start by giving a very simple introduction into who is the EWT COI, right? You see there's the name, two names there, EWT COI and Nian Polytechnic. Now this actually is because Nian Polytechnic is the organization that has worked with Enterprise Singapore. And we have been in partnership with Enterprise Singapore, which is one of Singapore's government agency, um, one of the economic agencies that is supporting the SME developments. So uh, as I mentioned, you should see the slides now showing the Enterprise Singapore and Nian Poly. So Nian Poly is a polytechnic that um, develops students into working adults in the area of industry. And with generally our students graduate with diplomas in specific areas. Right? And we do also focus on uh, agri. We have a school of life science that handles um, agriculture, horticulture, and even aquaculture. And we have been in partnership with our economic agency, Enterprise Singapore, since 2006. Right? So we've not been around very long, but as you will see later on, we do have quite a bit of projects already in the area of agriculture. Now, a little bit about what we do before we go into the projects is that we do have we do have quite a wide range of multidisciplinary expertise. So if you look at the left side of the screen, you will see the core capabilities. And we pretty much cover every engineering area you can think of, all the way from physics to chemistry to environmental and even material science. right? And we do even have life sciences expertise in the center. Now, what does this uh, do for us? Right? As you can hear from the name of our center, Environment and Water Technology Center of Innovation, we cover almost everything under the sun. And it can be anything from water to waste management to energy management, right? And these are also the same technology domains that we are focusing on, right? And for today, most of the projects will be coming from my membrane and water technology domain, okay? But at the same time, you will also start to hear, or you may already have been hearing about how the uh, water, energy, and waste nexus comes together. Right? And this is where we are actually very well positioned in order to provide solutions that take a look at the whole uh, holistic view of the industry itself. And just a bit of snapshot about what we have done. Right? We have been doing a lot of consultancy projects. We are a unit that is fully focused on 100% industry facing. Right? So we do a lot of industry projects. We do a lot of collaborations. We do a lot of partnerships. And we have actually grown from a single laboratory till today, we have 15 laboratories. And we also have a pretty high-end equipment that we are using to do a lot of materials analysis, such as your scanning electron microscope and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to share with you about what we do. It's really just to give you a bit of a snapshot as to why we are doing what we are doing, right? And I'm just going to jump very quickly into case studies. I'm quite mindful that we don't have a lot of time. So I've picked uh, uh, four cases to share with you on some of the projects that we have done. And I'll share with you some of the benefits of the technology. And at the same time, well, because we are able to look at multiple aspects of the project, we also can start to identify that while we work on one aspect of the solution, we also need to look at how do we deploy this in totality, right? Because your solution may have downstream effects on other parts of the system. So the very first project I'm going to introduce is going to be on how we help with the freshwater reduction. Right? And what we mean by freshwater reduction is that we reduce the reliance on tap water. And this is something that is of interest to Singapore, as you can imagine, right? because Singapore is a very small island. We have very, very limited water resources. And you may have heard of some of the, the water resources that Singapore uses, which is good from desalination. We have water that we take in, we import in from Malaysia. right? We also have um, water that we take in from our reservoirs, which is your rainwater collection. Right, now this is actually a project that we did for an ornamental fish. Yeah, this is an ornamental fish farm. 
But effectively, we do feel that the water quality parameters are quite similar in terms of um, food fish as well. Uh, understand Agri tends to look at food fish more, right? But in Singapore, we also have a very large ornamental fish industry. And primarily, they are also aquaculture based. And of course, the only difference is in the water parameters. Yeah, so for this particular case, we were looking at mainly water recovery as well as stability and color removal. Right, so what we have done, this is a system that uses a MBBR. It's an MBBR and a silica carbide um, membrane that helps in the recycling. So the technology here, I'm not actually going into the technology because that will be a little bit too technical and may take too much time for, for this presentation. So you will see on the top right hand side of the picture, that's actually where the system is. This is a system that one of our clients is developing. They have put in a MBBR, a moving bed biofilm reactor, as well as a silica carbide membrane to do the filtration after the MBBR. And you will also take a look at the bottom right. You will see there are three bottles of water. Okay, and the, the one that's right at the, the right hand side, that's tap water. And the one that's in the middle, that's the permeate, or rather what we could call the treated water. Okay, so you can see that the treated water is quite close to your tap water. And you will see that it removes all the green algae and also all the particulates. And that's where you get your turbidity and color removal, right? And all the other water parameters falls within the regulatory limits. Okay, so this is a, a good sign that we are able to recycle the water. However, one of the challenges we face in this particular project is not really just about the water treatment, right? One of the other concerns is really on the ability to remove antibiotics. And in a lot of the cases, right, even in food fish agriculture, there is also some uh, controlled use of antibiotics. And the problem with recycling the water is that you don't want your water containing antibiotics to go back into your main tank. And that may actually cause some other problems of maybe antibiotic resistance or some other problems where fishes may have stunted growth because of the building con uh, concentrations of antibiotics. So this has actually led to another area where we are currently looking into. And we, this is on how can we remove antibiotics, right? That's one thing. Or is it really a management issue, right? And if it's a water management issue, the other concern is, should we then quarantine fishes that are under antibiotic treatment and allow the water to not be recycled, right? So this is one way of managing it. And again, it depends on what's the volume of the, the antibiotics uh, that's being used and the treatment of water that need, and the water that needs to be treated. Right? So there are a lot of things that we have to concern with. Now, on top of that, there is also the cost issue. Right? So cost issue, again, comes back down to um, whether the fish is of a value that you need a very high quality of water or whether you're looking at fish that are fairly low value. Then that sort of changes the kind of treatment system that you will deploy. Right? Again, it is hard to, for me to give you a very clear indication which system works best for which fish. It really comes down to what is your site conditions as well as what are the fish you are breeding or growing. Now from freshwater, we move on to marine water, right? Because most of the fish, a lot of times, well, at least for Singapore, a lot of the, the locals like to eat marine fish, right? Because freshwater fish tend to have a muddy taste. So we also started to look at marine water recycling and we were able to also achieve very similar results as compared to freshwater, right? We were even able to remove total organic carbon as well. Yeah, and the, the additional complication for marine water recycling is actually on the salt rejection, right? And here we actually achieved a salt rejection of less than 10%. However, you will see that NMPs are not removed, which, which is your free nitrogen and your phosphates that are not removed. And this actually requires a biological system for the removal, right? In this test setup, you will notice on the top right, that's the test setup, there is no MBBR system in place. And this is because of the the client that wanted to test this without an MBBR, all right? So we were able to show to the client clearly that while your system can remove turbidity as well as the TOC, but it does not address the NMP. Now you will see that although salt rejection is less than 10%, that can also be a problem in the long term, right? Because if you remove, even if you remove 5% of salt, over time, as you cycle the, the water through your system, you are gradually removing 5%, 5%, 5% every time. And this will actually reduce the salt in your water. And you may end up topping your salt. Now, this needs to be balanced with the amount of salt that you are topping up anyway, because this is a land-based farm. 
And in a land-based farm, the farmer actually has to uh, dose in the salt because he's using tap water, which is fresh, right? And the tap water is fresh, so he's got to dose in lots of salt to ensure that it achieves the salinity required for the fish growth. Now, this is where they need to balance. If we use this system, you would have to balance the salt rejection, meaning that you are removing some salt every time you do the processing, the treatment of the water, and you need to then measure in how much of the salt you need to replace. Right? So this could actually be more beneficial, but it really needs a bit of a larger analysis. For this project that we did with a company, they did not go into the long-term studies, but we were recommending them to look at how they can balance the salt replacement along with the salt rejection that is achieved in their system. Right? So I'm, I'm sharing with you not just some projects that we've done, but also some of the challenges that we face. And these are real ground challenges. Right? These are not done in the lab. And you can see from the pictures that these are all done on site. We went on to the, uh, um, the local farmers and we went on to test with the water treat systems that they have. Some of these are taken from the sums and some of these are taken directly from their, their tanks itself. Right? So you will also see that the quality of the permeates are actually quite good. Right? We removed the algae, the particulates, and it actually meets the requirements of the farmers. The only problem is, of course, with the NMPs as well as the salt rejection. Now, I'll take you to a slightly different thing. The first two projects that I showed you was more on the aquaculture-based approach, right? That was really for the ornamental fish and for possibly food fish farmers as well. Now, this system is actually not for, not for aquaculture. This is from a chicken farmer, right? And we have done a project where we work with a chicken farmer. They are actively treating the chicken waste and converting the chicken waste into energy, right? And this is through the use of an anaerobic digestion plant. So you'll see from the table that on the top right, top left hand corner of the, uh, the, the um, flow chart, there is an anaerobic digestion plant. <clears throat> so the, the, the farmer actually generates energy from the anaerobic digestion through the biogas generation. What happens after anaerobic digestion is that you end up with a effluent. Now this effluent is actually very good as fertilizer. Right? Now the problem with the effluent is it does need some pretreatment. Okay, so you will see the system that we have on the top left. That's our pretreatment system for the liquid effluent. And this pretreatment system helps to remove all the particulates because what we want is really just the liquid, right? We want the liquid. And what do we want with the liquid? You can see in the picture, we have the feed. This is the feed that goes in. Now, what is our technology that we have put into this, tech, uh, this project? It's called membrane distillation, right? And if you look at number three, right in the middle of the slide, there is this thing called distill which has a trademark logo to it. Now, this still is a system of what we call membrane distillation. And membrane distillation allows us to concentrate liquids. And one of the examples of concentration, you can see in the screen, the insert on the feed for the MD is on the, the three beakers. The brownish color one is the feed from the anaerobic um, effluent. And on the right side is the concentrate from the membrane distillation, right? This is actually concentrated fertilizer and can be sold as concentrated fertilizer to farmers. And you will see, of, aside from the concentration, we also recover water, right? Which you can then use for watering your plants. Okay, and uh, over here, this circular ecosystem, why is it circular? It's because in this same project that we engaged with this client, this chicken farmer, uh, they, they are farming the chickens for their eggs, by the way, just in case you are wondering, right? So we, we worked with this farmer, they wanted to go into a very circular ecosystem. Right? Some people call it circular economy. They wanted the chicken waste to generate energy and the chicken waste to then become a resource. And in this case, the resource is fertilizer. Now, at the same time, the fertilizer, they were also exploring its use in hydroponics farming. And you will see we have used it to grow vegetables. All right, and not only vegetables, we have also used it for microalgae cultivation. Okay, just give me a minute while the picture comes up. There you go. Okay, so we also use it for microalgae cultivation. Now, why were they interested in microalgae? Right, this is something that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, microalgae does have benefits when you put it as feed back into your chicken feed. Okay, so microalgae like chlorella and spirulina has been shown to have benefits for animals when you put it into their feed. And a lot of the uh, um, high value animal feed actually contains some degree of algae or microalgae. And you can then see it starts to become a very circular ecosystem. The chickens that lay the eggs for sale produces the waste. The waste becomes fertilizer. It fertilizes the vegetables for sale. 
right? And at the same time, the waste can also go into microalgae cultivation that provides the nutritional supplements back into the chicken feed. And this becomes a very nice story to tell. And at the same time, the farmer is able to diversify their business operations to not just sell chicken eggs, but they can also sell vegetables and even microalgae if they wanted to, right? But the microalgae here, because it is produced from uh, uh, chicken waste, is generally not recommended for human consumption, right? So this is better, best used back into animal feed. So this is one example where we have done it with a, a chicken farmer. So they are not your traditional farms that may use a lot of water, right? But here the water comes into play because the waste that is produced does require some form of water treatment. And the water treatment here can be further refined to give you usable byproducts, which is your fertilizer and even clean water. And I thought to show another project. This is the last project I'm going to show. And I might spend a little bit of time here uh, because this is a pretty interesting project that we did that is not exactly water related, right? Of course, soft shell crabs do, crabs do need to be farmed with water. And I thought to share this here to give you a bit of a sense as to what kind of diverse projects we handle in the center. Yeah, and here we are looking at an autonomous soft shell crab farming harvesting system. Right. Many of you, or well, maybe some of you that are familiar with soft shell crabs may, may know how it, is, how it is being farmed. And just for the sake of the rest of you that are not familiar, I'll just give you a very quick explanation. Right. You can see on the left picture, that's actually where we have the housing, individual housing for the crabs. And these crabs need to be housed individually because soft shell crabs are farmed when they have molted from their shells. Right. So you, you harvest them when they have just freshly molted and they have their new crab shells have not hardened yet. So that's where you get your soft shell crab, right? They are not actually um, naturally found that way. You know, this is a transition period, right? And this transition period happens within a very short window. Within six hours, they have, their shells will actually harden. And once it hardens, you can't harvest it anymore. So you can imagine if it takes six hours to, to harden, then it has to be checked every four hourly to ensure that the crabs are harvested when they are ready. Okay, now this is very manual intensive. And one of the ways that we were asked to look into how can we support this was how could we automate this whole process, right? So I have a very simple video over here to give you a rough idea of what we do, right? Now, before I show the video, I'll just give you a very, a very short explanation. This is essentially a, a robotic car, right? And this robotic car comes equipped with sensors and cameras. And what it does is that we have designed a special housing system. Again, in the left picture, you can see the robot on the platform in the left picture. It actually travels across the top of the enclosures. And at each enclosure, it will stop and take some, some pictures. And each time it takes a picture, there is an algorithm in the back end that will detect whether the shell, the crabs has molted or not. All right, so let's take a look at the video and you'll have an idea what I'm talking about. Okay, you can see the robot is moving to the enclosure. It stops, it takes a picture, and then it moves on to the next enclosure. All right, and this happens autonomously. And we are having multiple levels of these enclosures filled with, um, with crabs. Okay, so that's a very short video. It's just to give you an idea of how it works. Uh, of course, there's a lot of technology that's gone into it. It's not just about IoT. There's a lot of uh, mechanical design, uh, sensing, and knowing water, right? I, I'm, I thought this is a very nice project to highlight to you because although we are not managing water, the water impacts the way we do the, um, the prototype, right? And let me just give you a few ideas why there's a problem or why it affects the, 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 the design. Um, look at the bottom right pictures. You will see pictures of the crabs. Yeah, now, if you were to take a picture of the enclosure, there are going to be several things that comes up. One is you're going to get a reflection of the, the light, right? You need a light source to capture your, your picture. So water is definitely going to reflect your light. Now, at the same time, it's not just still water. Don't forget that your water needs to be constantly pumping, right? You need fresh water to flow into the enclosures. So there's going to be ripples on the, on the water surface, and that's going to add further complication to taking a picture. Yeah, and as you can imagine, there's a lot of other concerns as well. Yeah, and even when the crabs has a slime layer, a biofilm layer on the shell, it also affects the capturing of the, the crab pictures. And you will see here that we have certain accuracies. Um, based on this project, we actually have managed to uh, achieve an accuracy of 98.8% detection when the crab has molted. This is just with a single picture with a single pass. 
right? So again, you can always take multiple pictures to enhance the, the accuracy. And this will then notify the farmer about which location, which enclosure is the crab ready to be harvested. And rather than having to spend a human labor force to check every four hours, they now just need to have a person sitting in front of the monitor and maybe not even sitting in front of the monitor, right? Everything can be connected to your mobile phone now. So you can send a notification to your mobile phone and let you know that this crab is ready to be harvested, right? So that's some of the projects that we are doing. And, and I thought that if you want to find out more, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn presence, you know, or you can always uh, uh, ask me a chat, ask me a question in the Q&A as well. Right, I, I see some questions in the Q&A. So I will just take a few minutes to answer some of the questions. Right, there's a question here on the minimum amount of waste generation required and the capacity of generator. Uh, okay, in the area of water, it's really about the water volume, right? Now, some of the projects that you've seen, the smallest volume we have is a one meter cube per hour treatment system, right? One meter cube translates to roughly 1,000 liters per hour. That's the smallest that we are able to get it down to at the moment. Right. If you need any smaller, we do have some concerns on the cost benefit effectiveness. Right. So that is the challenge. When it comes to water treatment, more is always best. Right. If you have less, we need to really look at what are the absolute requirements to see whether we can downsize, customize, so that we reduce unnecessary costs. But so far, one meter cube seems to be the smallest that is most cost effective. Right. Are there any other questions that uh, anybody has on this? area of technology. Yep. Just to highlight a little bit, we, we don't really do a lot of fundamental uh, research into new technologies. We focus more on the, ups, the more downstream processes where it is filling that gap between how the technologies can translate from research into industry. And that's the ideal location, uh, the ideal spot that we find ourselves best able to really help in the uh, deployment of such technologies, right? And I, give, I can give you a few examples where companies have actually come to us and these are solution provider companies have come to us with patterns from universities and we have actually helped to scale up these patterns into commercializable solutions for the industry, right? So that's just one of the, the models that we work. Yeah, there are of course other models. It really depends on um, what is your request and at what stage you are at in your development journey.